I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the Steps to Build Community Driven Projects webinar. I'm very excited to be giving this one today because um, I was able, this is built on a personal story that I came across last fall. Um, but before we get started, I would really like to acknowledge the Algonquin people on whose territory I am right now. And uh, I'd like to ask the creator that the presentation provide each participant with some information that will help them. And I'm hoping also that you get inspired and, and maybe um, find a way that you can launch a community-driven project or maybe assist somebody in your community or your organization in doing something like this. It's very, very valuable. Um, so I hope that you enjoy today. Um, first of all, I'll introduce myself. My name is Isabel Obey. I'm the president and founder of Native Way Training Services. Uh, my company specializes in creating, adapting, and delivering resources uh, regarding health and fitness and, and sport as well. We just came back from uh, teaching a six-day Aboriginal Community Warrior course in uh, St. Mary's First Nation, New Brunswick. And uh, what that is is a fitness certification for Aboriginal people uh, with some community mobilization training and some sport development training as well. Um, and we will be delivering more across Canada. If you want to have more information, just give me a call or send me an email and I can tell you a little bit more about that. So to create these webinars, we work with uh, a few partners. Um, I'd like to invite Agnes Croxford to introduce herself and uh, also explain her role in the webinars that we are delivering. Agnes? OK, sorry. I'm having trouble with the muting and unmuting as well. <laughs> this is Agnes Croxford from the Leisure Information Network. Uh, we're a national nonprofit organization. And our um, function is to provide information online uh, to people who work or volunteer in parks and recreation. Uh, our role in this uh, project was to redevelop the Northern Links website. And for those of you staying on the call at the end, I'll be giving a quick tour of the site. And we're also the technical hosts for um, these webinars. So I'll look forward to, to um, talking to you again at the end. But just before I, I pass you back to Isabel, um, I just want to mention that we are very anxious to collect any resources that uh, you may have to contribute to the website. Um, that could be in the form of uh, traditional games or program ideas that you're running, including some of the community-driven projects that we may talk about today, or any of the little forms or checklists that you use in your projects. So I'll put my email address into the chat box and uh, hope I'll hear back from you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Agnes. I'd also like to talk about Queen's University. Uh, these webinars are a continuation of the Everybody Gets to Play workshops that we delivered across Canada to Aboriginal community workers um, in 2011. And we were fortunate enough to partner with Queen's University who was taking some information and, and seeing what the progress was. And, and this is ongoing at this time. They've also decided to join us for this uh, webinar series. So I'd like to invite Colin to introduce himself and perhaps describe his role in this project. Colin? Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Colin, and I'm a student here at Queen's University. I just want to speak a little bit to the evaluation that we're uh, doing for this webinar series. Um, if you were involved in a Everybody Gets to Play Toolkit workshop, then this is essentially a continuation of that evaluation. If not, we simply just want to know whether the webinar format is a good way of providing online information for people um, in this way. Uh, if you have any questions about the webinar at all, I'll enter my information, both my phone number and email, into the chat box so people can uh, contact me if they wish. Um, if you are participating, we really appreciate it. Each evaluation takes about five minutes to complete, and you have a chance to win a $25 gift certificate. So I certainly encourage anyone who would like to to participate in that. Thank you so much, Colin. Um, and lastly, I'd like to speak for CPRA. Uh, CPRA is a grassroots network, uh, is a vibrant grassroots network with partnerships that connect people who build healthy, active communities and impact everyday lives of all Canadians. I've been working with uh, CPRA since 2011, and I have to say that it's been a great organization for to support and to promote physical activity and uh, even just the project with Everybody Gets to Play for the Aboriginal communities. It's been an honor to be working with them as they have 
have been very supportive in that aspect. So we say miigwech to CPRA. I'd also like to invite Jennifer Pelte, who is our technical savior, <laughs> if she could just introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer, and I will be sitting in on the webinar today as technical support. Um, if you look into the chat box, you'll see that I've provided um, my email address. Should any issues come up for anybody, please do send me an email at jpeltier at lynn.ca, and that's there in the chat. Um, and just to make everyone aware um, throughout the call, if you did want to contribute anything over the phone, please feel free. And uh, to do so, you can unmute your line by selecting pound six, and uh, to mute your line, selecting star six, and I will put that in the chat box as well. And off to you, Isabel. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. So for today's goals, we have, um, we're going to talk about a successful community-driven di project. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story of uh, Jean Knockwood and uh, the lady that I met last fall. The next thing we're going to be doing is demonstrate five steps to building a community-driven project. Um, goal number three will be we'll talk a little bit about community economic devel development throughout the presentation. And the fourth one will be uh, we'll outline a little bit of the benefits of, to the community of uh, building these projects. So the format of the session, there will be delivery of information with some questions asked through polls. We'll have the evaluation after the information session. We'll also have an open discussion and sharing with the participants. So if you have any questions or comments or something that you'd like to share, a successful project you'd like to share, that would be the time to do it. Uh, then we'll have the last poll questions evaluating exchange. And Agnes, as she mentioned, will deliver a brief tour of the Northern Links website with all of the resources that are available to you. So poll number one, for those of you who don't have uh, internet, I'll just read the question. So have you ever built community-driven projects that benefited your community? So if you could just answer, that would be very appreciated. So the, the answers are yes, no, and no vote. And I believe everybody has voted. Great. Is there another question? So the next question is, please rate your general knowledge of building community-driven projects. So one is, I have a lot of knowledge about building community-driven projects. Two is, I have some knowledge about building community-driven projects. And the third one is, I have no knowledge about building community-driven projects. And at this time, the leader is the second one, I have some knowledge about building community-driven projects at 62%. I believe that's everyone. Wonderful. So before we start, we're going to talk about, we're going to do an outline of the physical activity guidelines for spinal cord injury. Spinal cord injury, um, abbreviated SCI, affects an estimated of 86,000 individuals living in Canada. And the number of SCI cases are projected to increase over the next two decades, affecting an estimated 121,000 people by 2030. So healthy individuals with SCI, if they want to improve their fitness, they should participate in at least 20 minutes of moderate to vigorous aerobic activity two times per week, as well as strength training twice a week. Some aerobic activities that are appropriate for people with SCI are cycling, body weight supported treadmill walking, or water exercise. And for the strength training exercises, they can use weights or elastic resistance bands that will help get the heart rate up, improve health, and prevent muscle atrophy. So community-driven projects are an opportunity to get our people to work together and get our communities healthier and happier. This is where I'm going to take a moment and talk to you about a woman that I met last fall. I was in Halifax giving a, I can't remember what it was, it was a, an event, a workshop. I was working with some community workers. And uh, the elder there was uh, Doug Knockwood from Indian Brook. And um, he and I uh, connected. And uh, when we weren't uh, working with the participants, he took me a, for a tour around Halifax. And he brought me back to his community. Um, and he brought me back to meet his daughter-in-law, which is Jean Knockwood. And I have to tell you, it was quite, um, quite a pivotal moment for me. Uh, he brought me there, and uh, <laughs> she's a very strong Mi'kmaq woman, and, and I really, really appreciate that. But as I walked into her house, you know, she offered me tea, she offered me food, and then she started asking me a lot of hard-hitting questions. 
who I was, where I was from, who was my family. And that went on for about 30 minutes. And I have to tell you that uh, had I not been a confident person, I probably would have been shaken up a little bit. But it was, uh, you know, I totally respected it because here I was coming into a new community, um, into her home. So she wanted to know who I was and what I was doing. So we, ha we had a great conversation. And then she, she shared with me what she did. So this is a lady who is incredible. She's like a strong force uh, in the, the Indian Brook community. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about her story before we get started on the framework. So what she told me was that uh, about eight years ago, her daughter was in high school. And she was a victim of a racial incident. And so she came home that evening, and uh, she told her mom. And her mom, being a strong woman, she said, that's it. I'm, I'm not going to be sending her back to that school. So what she did was she went to a chief and council meeting, and she announced that to the chief and council and said, I'm going to be homeschooling my daughter because this happened, and it's no longer acceptable. And she said that she went through that, and she doesn't want her children to go through that because it's not necessary. And uh, so she decided she's going to homeschool. When she got home that night from the meeting, there were seven kids there and their parents saying, can you please homeschool me as well? So here she was driven by an event that spoke to her heart, and she took a stand. And you know, right away, that same night that she announced it, seven kids were to be, joined, to be joining her daughter. So it didn't take long. There were up to 10 kids. And that's when she said, I can't. You know, I can't be taking care of 10 kids uh, at a time. She, you know, she was planning on just doing one. So what she did was she went to see uh, the band council and uh, then went to see the school. And um, I'm not sure if, if everybody uh, has the same arrangement in their community or their province, but um, the way that it works there, uh, they have a tuition agreement. If the kids are going to school off-reserve, there's a tuition agreement, and the band council gives $4,000 a year per kid. So what she did was she went to the school and said, I, you know, I have 10 children here who uh, are going to be homeschooled by me, and we paid, our band council paid $4,000 each for them to be there, but they're not going back to school. So, you know, what are you going to do about it? Do, you know, give us our money back. And uh, so what the school decided to do was they decided to send two teachers over to teach. And so, um, so she got the help that she needed, and they were teaching in the church basement. Um, but they told her that come next fall, the children had to be back, or the kids, they were youth, I mean, they are in high school. She said the youth had to be back in the high school because they weren't going to do that again. And she refused. She said, no, this, I, we're taking control of our children's education. We're providing a safe environment for them. We're not doing that. So what she did is she, took, she did some research, and she found out that um, they could actually get some, you know, more money for, to, to have their, their kids um, at school. But the way that it had to happen, they had to have a, 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 a band-controlled school board. And so she did her research, and there were a few of them in Nova Scotia. She's in Nova Scotia. And the first one she asked, they refused. Uh, they decided not to get involved. But the second one, they decided to, to, they agreed. They agreed to help her. And this was the Wagma Cape Breton Nova Scotia uh, school board. And uh, the CEO there was Brian Arbutnot, and he decided to support her. So what they did is they, they became the school board for the Indian Brook School, and they provided her with textbooks, with uh, all the support that she needed, the teachers, the curriculum, and everything. And so from that, um, they were able to get more money. They were able to access that $4,000 per kid. And what they did was they, they at first they had... Um, uh, you know, little trailers that they were teaching in, but with the money they were able to renovate the community center, and um, they created the school in the community center, and they added a kitchen to that, which I'm going to come to after, which will be the economic development. Um, so from there, they, you know, they went from, I think she started with seven kids to ten kids. And then the first year they went to 30 kids, and then 100 kids, and the third, uh, yeah, sorry, the second year was 100 kids, year three was 125 kids. And it just kept growing and growing. Um, and uh, so the other thing that she found out was that Indian Affairs pays $6,000 per child. So they were actually able to get some more money. Um, the school board would pay 4000 and then uh, Indi Indian Affairs would actually uh, um, add the rest. 
so they're able to create an even better environment for their kids. Now, I want to talk to you about the economic development. What This lady is very smart, and obviously she wasn't working alone. She had to have the support of the community. But <clears throat> the way that she grew it was that um, when she saw the, the money that she could get, she put together a budget, and she was laughing to me. We were actually just talking this morning. Um, but she was saying you know, they didn't have a computer, so they had an overhead projector. So what they had done was they had put together the budget of how much money would come in for each kid, how much everything would cost, and they had uh, a couple of economic development workshops with the parents. So they would invite the parents to come, and they would show them you know, everything, what was coming in, what was coming out, where it was going, and they would ask their um, input to find out what curriculum did they want to have, what did they want their children to, to have access to, where would the money be spent, which was incredible because um, oftentimes we don't understand the workings of a school or even a, a business opportunity. We don't get to see the background. So they got an education on how uh, this project was being run and what was needed. And uh, you know, they collaborated on, on uh, the function of it as well. So that, that was uh, a, an amazing gift to the community. The other thing that they did was they wanted every kid to have breakfast. So with the kitchen, they had hired you know, some cooks. They had hired people to clean. They had hired teachers. Um, so they're contributing to the economic development as well by creating jobs. So every child was fed every morning. And she said that it was important that it didn't matter what the hierarchy or what the financial situation was of any family. They had access to that breakfast. And the other thing that she did was that if there was a problem with one of the parents, if the parent wanted to come speak with her, what she would do is she would send them to the restaurant or the kitchen. She would make sure that they were fed and relaxed, and then she would go talk to them. She said it made things a lot more pre pleasant because um, you know, if you're fed, if you're taking care of, you're treated well, then you know that um, it's so much easier to resolve a conflict or an issue. So some of the other things that she did that made her school um, special was that uh, with the parents, some of the rules that they came together was uh, that they put together were um, so no student was ever kicked out. It didn't matter what they did, they would never kick them out. What they would do was they would send them home, and the next day the parent they would have to come back with their parents, and she would have either one or two elders there, and they would have a circle. So it was the children who, if it was a fight or you know some kind of problem with more than one kid. Um, they would have the circle, so the kids would be there. They would have to come with their parents, and if their parents couldn't be there, then their grandparents would be there. The teachers would be there. She called herself not a principal but a school manager, so she would be there along with the elders. And what they would do is they would have a circle. So the elder would be running the circle, and she said that the first round, everybody was mad. So everybody was just you know, speaking their heart and, and you know, saying sometimes they were blaming, sometimes they were yelling. It didn't matter. So everybody had the, that turn. She said the second one is where uh, the second round, the circle round, where people got to speak, uh, that's when the resolution would start. And uh, so they would start looking at you know, the possibilities. People would start taking responsibility. Um, and you know, they'd look for a solution. And the th by the time the third circle came along, she said that most people were peaceful. They had said enough. They'd said their peace. And um, then it, it, uh, what she found was that uh, there was a couple of locations where there was a fourth round, but that was very rare because she said usually by the time that the third round came along, people were feeling so much better. Um, but she said that what these circles did was they gave everybody a voice. Everybody was able to speak their mind and, and say exactly what they were feeling and, and you know, the reasoning behind their behavior, whatever happened. And then it, it would work everything out. She said the people who participated in that circle, she, she wouldn't see them again. They, uh, you know, or the same incident wouldn't happen again because everybody was heard. So the respect was there. Um, and it didn't matter how much time it would be, it would take. It took the time that it needed. And uh, with the elders' involvement, um, you know, there was the cultural aspect that was there and the seven grandfather teachings. So that, that was pretty interesting when she was uh, describing that. The other thing that she did was instead uh, they would start their morning with the Mi'kmaq honor song. So not only did the kids start with culture, but they remembered where they came from and they honored their ancestors. 
So that, that was something pretty special. And she said that some of the other things that um, made it special was that she made sure she greeted every child and she would tell them that, you know, they were important, that they were the reason that the school existed and that um, they were appreciated. So right there, that added that personal touch that, uh, that we're all looking for in the end, and, and kids especially, you know, regardless of what's going on at home, whether it's pleasant or not, if you're shown that you're appreciated and that the adults see you, that makes a big difference in your life. Um, and she said that also every Friday night before they took off, <laughs> she said she would stand at that door and, um, you know, she would say, tell them, have a great weekend and, you know, I'll talk to you later and well done on whatever. So, you know, it was building that relationship and that respect for the kids. And um, so, uh, you know, the project that she put together was incredible and it wasn't easy. Um, she said there were times when th she wasn't that po popular, and that was from our conversation in September, not this morning. But uh, you know, there was there was some opposition, and but it, more important than that, she saw the need for the project. You know, she let go of the personal aspect of it and did her best to do what needed to get done for the children. And um, she didn't anticipate it was going to get that big. She just wanted to take care of her daughter, and what happened was she ended up taking care of her community. So that school is still going on now, and it's going quite strong. Um, I did ask her before we hung up um, what she, what recommendations she would have for anyone who would want to start a community-driven project. And this is what she said. She said, uh, be open-minded. She said, you know, you have to think outside the box. If she would have just listened to the, the school officials and saying that the kids needed to get back in school that fall, then all of this wouldn't have happened. She wouldn't have helped her community, but she refused. She said, no, I'm going to take care of my kids, and we're going we're gonna to make this happen. We're going to do it our way and, you know, to respect our culture. And uh, she said that once that you start thinking outside the box, um, a world of opportunity starts. She goes, it's so freeing because you see you're not bound by the restrictions that are imposed on you, that you can actually do anything that you want to do to help your people. Um, yeah, so th those were some of the words that she said, never to give up, obviously. She said, uh, you know, you have to listen to your heart and stand up for what's, what's right. Um, uh, she is actually uh, featured in a book called Strong Women's Stories. It's a native vision of creating a community-based school. I don't have the author right now, but I will be looking at it. Uh, looking for it and hopefully either posting it on here or if you want to Google it and share it with others, that would be great as well. Um, but uh, she also uh, offered her phone number and her email. So I'll be posting that a little bit later on, probably at the end. And uh, she said that she would be open to um, answering any questions if anybody would like to uh, ask some questions or find out how she did everything that she did. So that's the inspiration for this whole webinar. Um, and then I'm going to start with the framework of how to get things started and how to get things done. So community-driven development, CDD, we'll use that for short, uh, is a development initiative that provides control of the development process, resources, and decision-making authority directly to community groups. So the underlying assumption of CDD projects are that communities are the best judges of how their lives and livelihoods can be improved. And if provided with adequate resources and information, they can organize themselves to provide for their immediate and long-term needs. Moreover, CDD programs are motivated by their trust in people, and it advocates people changing their own environment as a powerful force for development. By treating people as assets and partners in the development process, previous studies have shown that CDD is responsive to local demands, inclusive, and more cost-effective compared to centrally-led, non-governmental organization-based programs. And that was something that um, Jean mentioned to the parents. She explained to them when she had that community uh, development workshop with the parents, she said to them, when we're sending our kids outside of the community, what happens is that all that money is going outside and it's being invested in something that doesn't benefit our community. But if we can invest it with them, then we're uh, helping our, our future generations by creating our own economy. CDD can also be supported by strengthening and financing community groups, facilitating community access to information, and promoting 
an enabling environment through policy and institutional reform. CDD projects work by providing communities with fun searching generating opportunities during which they develop crucial skills. If she wouldn't have talked to Brian from uh, the, the, the board, she wouldn't have known about the extra money that she could have done and how she could build the, the school in her community. So we have to be able to, to ask outside and ask other communities as well um, to find out how they put things together. And even in mainstream, we can find out. We can give them a call and find out how they structured their, their funding, where did they get it. You know, that funding can be available to Aboriginal communities as well. So once funding for development is secured, the community needs to decide how best to spend the money, promoting both decision-making skills as well as accountability. So her gathering up the parents and having an open book policy and, and showing the budget of you know, what was coming in, what was coming out, and where it was going was incredibly beneficial because it created more understanding and less blame from the parents because they had a part in the decision. So lastly, the community plans and builds a project and takes responsibility for monitoring its progress. And that's what she did as well. She had regular meetings with the parents so that they could see how things were going and make other decisions and how to integrate uh, the culture into the school. So not only do they create what is needed, they, also, they are also developing a community skill set that can be applied to any other community need. So this community came together for the school, but they could do the same for anything. You know, sport and recreation right now is crucial to help our, our communities get healthy. So every, all the steps that they went through to build that school, they can apply for other things. You know, there are still many communities who don't have um, facilities to, to hold um, any kind of event and promote physical activity. So maybe this is a model that they should have a look at. So in the long run, this will ensure sustainability and continual growth. Um, one of the things that she did say was that the, the people who participated, the students who participated in the school went on to university. And she said quite a few of them are at, have actually come back to their community and are contributing, either working in the band council or teaching at the school or assisting. Others are doing administration. She said, I think there are three Marines that came out of that. Um, you know, they've gone on to be successful. So we're going to have a look at the community action model. This is a five-step community-driven model designed to build communities capacity to address health disparities through mobilization. Fundamental to the model is a critical analysis identifying the underlying social, economic, and environmental forces that create health and social inequities in, in a community. Promoting environmental change by moving away from projects that focus solely on changing individual lifestyles and behaviors to mobilizing community members and governing bodies. And this is what happened to Dean without her planning on it, right? Because I had mentioned that she was only looking to help her daughter, and then she ended up helping her community, which is pretty interesting, to say the least. So we do this to eliminate characteristics of the community that promote economic, social, and environmental inequalities. So assisting people in acquiring the skills needed to do it themselves. The community action model provides a framework for community members to acquire the skills and resources they need to assess and improve the community's health. And that would include some of the teachers needed some training to be able to teach the kids. Culturally speaking, community health will include the four aspects of the medicine wheel the mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual. And she did this in so many different ways, just by involving the elders and getting the family together. Um, she made sure that the culture was respected with the Mi'kmaq Honor Song. There's so many ways that we can do this, and it doesn't need to be complicated either. Just playing that song in the morning can reach somebody in a way that you know, words can't. So the first step is we need to identify the issue. So we choose an area of focus. So for Jean, it was the racism. She wanted to provide a safe environment for her daughter. Community diagnosis or action research is essential to determine the root causes of a community issue and outline the resources necessary to overcome it. So this helps us focus our energy in the right area to create the necessary community change we are looking to accomplish. Now we have that in the Everybody Gets to Play Toolkit. We can do an organizational assessment and a community assessment. If you have access to that, it's a great tool to review on a regular basis so you can see what you have and what you need. So step number two, you want to complete a community organization assessment to determine what resources already exist, who the key contributors will be, and what exactly is missing. 
So this is a crucial step, as no solution to dismantle inequalities can be reached without the full involvement and leadership of the communities most affected. Step number three, you want to analyze results and begin gathering your project leaders and partners. Explore all the different solutions that can be applied. So that was going to get the band controlled uh, board. It was uh, recruiting some others to help in the kitchen, uh, the teachers, the elders. So the community action plan, CAPS, are a planning document specific for each community. So the community members decide which projects are relevant to their development needs and prioritize their, those projects. Finally, they quantify the resources needed, distinguishing be between outsiders' resources, which is the government funds or other donor funds. So we could consider that INAC or the, um, the board, and resources community can provide by themselves or using the donor point of view, this is called the community con contribution. So this would have been the, um, the community center that they use, the kitchen. Um, and, and also Jean herself, she was a resource uh, as a school manager. So these plans, they include the goals and timelines, project governance and decision-making process, the roles and responsibilities of everyone involved, the budget, risk management, what could go wrong, conflict resolution plan, which these were the elders, and sustainability plan, how they gave back to their community with the kitchen. Um, she was mentioning that when the kitchen wasn't being used for the school, they actually opened it up to the community. So she was generating um, income that way, and that money would go back into the school. So they would be serving meals to whoever uh, wanted to have a meal uh, while they weren't taking care of the kids, which was brilliant. So policy development is key to project success. It helps us to be more efficient in our actions, and it helps us implement an environmental change action, as well as activities intended to support them. Step number four, you want to implement your action plan. You want to evaluate the progress, and you want to adjust and modify as needed, which is exactly what Jean did, because she started out with seven. Well, she started out with one, went to seven, to 10, to 30, to 100, to 125. So each of these steps, she had to adjust, and she had to find a, a different way to, to make it functional and harmonious. So during the mobilization phase, communities can elect a community development committee composed of nine to 11 members. The CDC is effectively the recipient of the external internal funds and is responsible on behalf of the community of the field implementation, so of making it happen, everyday supervision, and management decisions. So step number five, you want to evaluate the success. You want to know what's working and what's not. You want to maintain the project. You want to keep it working. And you want to ensure sustainability or build another level of project function. So what she did, actually, because she started with high school students, it got to a point where they decided to uh, include the elementary school. And that was a whole other project in itself, as they had to have uh, at least 15 students to, to have a class. And what she did is she had to combine um, you know, grades so that uh, she could reach that. And then once she, she had 15 students, um, through the support of Brian from uh, the board, um, she found out that if she added five more students, the money that was from those five students, she could apply to the high school or to further develop their resources. So some of the benefits, community-driven development is an approach that acknowledges the concept of di diversity in, in the views, interests, and perceptions of each actor involved in the project. The community drives the project towards their perceived development goal. And sometimes, as in Jean's experience, it starts out as something and ends up as so much more. So this allows their decision makers to take well-informed management decisions during project implementation and planning of future interventions. Further on, monitoring results is for the Community Development Committee a mean of accountability towards the extended community and their donors. So by having these open meetings where she would show, or where all of them would show the budget, I mean, it, it created a responsibility not only to the people who were leading it, but who the peop for the people who were making the decisions, so the community members and the parents. So a major challenge in a CDD approach, especially if implemented in communities that never went through participatory development before, is to transfer the necessary skills and capacities first to the facilitators, and then from them to those members of the community that actively manage financial resources for project implementation. So that's from the leaders to the community members. 
So community-driven projects are great opportunities for enhancing community accountability by, one, building financial accountability to man maintain a correct bookkeeping procedures and key performance indicators to be collected in order to monitor this process. And two, promote external and internal accountability. So through participatory indicators, agree with the community to monitor if what the project is producing if the project is producing the expected results in the short, medium, and long run. Every member can learn from participating in a community-driven project. From the elders to the youth, it's an opportunity to get the people working together towards a common positive goal. This not only helps the community as a whole, it helps individuals grow and feel proud of their accomplishments, which in turn nurtures pride and builds confidence something that Aboriginal people need to regain after years of oppression. Community-driven projects bring us back to how things used to be pre-contact, a time where every member of the community was expected to contribute for the good of their nation. Many of the elders have said that we need to breathe the old teachings back to life to regain balance in the medicine wheel. Getting our communities to work together is a perfect opportunity to do just that. So I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation. It was, um, it was interesting for me to put it together, and it was inspiring to speak to Jean. I am going to be uh, putting down um, her, her uh, email and her phone number. Um, she now works for the Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative, and uh, so she is still busy, but she's very open to supporting other communities. Um, so I wish you success in all of your endeavors, and uh, please feel free to contact me should you ever have any questions or need anything to be developed. So poll number three, whoops, we're going to get back to that. Uh, for those of you who don't have a computer, um, how would you rate your organization's current building of community-driven projects? So the answers are from one to seven, one being low and seven being high. And I'm happy to see that, oh, now it's changing. So we have three that are 25%, four that are 12.5%, five 25%, six 12.5%, and high are 22.2%. Great. So I'd like to invite you to do the webinar evaluation. Colin will be taking care of that after this, uh, this webinar. And uh, if we're going to open up the phones, if anybody has a comment or has a question or something they'd like to share about another community project, that would be the perfect time for us to, to start this discussion. In the meantime, I'm just going to type in um, Jean's email and her phone number for you. So if anybody has anything they would like to add, if, if uh, I'd love to hear from the ones who, uh, the communities who already have a strong community-driven project um, uh, function. If anyone would like to share what they're doing in their communities, that would be excellent. So um, if we can unmute some of the lines, that'd be great. Hi, Isabel, it's Jennifer. So just as a note, uh, to unmute the lines is pound six on your telephone, and to, uh, to remute is a star six. Excellent. In the meantime, I'm just uh, typing in her email. So if anyone would like to share um, one of the projects he does, that'd be great. Or if you have any comments about the presentation, if you enjoyed it, if uh, there was something that you appreciated, you can share that as well. So I do see that somebody's just unmuted their line. Um, but not speaking. Hello. Hello. Hi, this is Danielle Huber. Hi. Hi, I just wanted to share um, just something that I'm in the works of doing, so I'm really glad that I got to hear this presentation. It's given me um, a better foundation of what I need to do because I'm such a newbie at this. Excellent. I'm glad to hear uh, that. Yeah, so I work for the Abbotsford School District as an Aboriginal um, contact as a support worker. Mm -hmm. And uh, me and a fellow um, co-worker are starting a group, and it would be like a mentoring 
for Aboriginal students to come here at the school to work on their math. So we would do a snack, have math, do a cultural um, maybe beading, or maybe we'd have like hoop dancing coming in, or uh, maybe weaving, um, something that the students would be interested in, and then just um, and then having then doing their math work and then going home. Mm. Um, just having the community involvement, so just um, getting my ideas down. And my other coworker, she sorry, my room just got busy. Um, she's a help, my helping teacher for the district, and we're just starting off. Um, and it's been really great. We have really positive. I work in a middle school, and all my teachers are um, willing to um, give me ideas and to help me. So getting a room set up, that's been helpful. Um, I think just maybe having, we're going to have the mentors be high school students that are cool. Aboriginal, that do well, that will come back. And then also having university students mentoring the high school students. So it would be like a full circle. And I think like having the idea of having the elders even coming in, that has sparked some interest for me as well. Like how do I get some elders to come in? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's fabulous. I, I got chilled as you were talking. <laughs> that's great. Um, so do you have elders that you work with sometimes? I do, and there are some here at the University of the Fraser Valley. Mm -hmm. They have um, an elder uh, mentoring program that they have there, and the elders come into classrooms to speak. Wow. At the university, so I'm thinking maybe I should have contact with them, and maybe they could come in as well. Absolutely, you know, and that's probably they're one of our most underused resources in our community, and I'm sure they would be more than happy to, to assist and, and be there with the kids. Wow, that's amazing. So you came up with this? You decided to do this? Well, I had seen it um, before. It kind of meant like um, it was called the Math Warriors program that they do in Saskatchewan. Mm. I went to a conference and I seen that and I thought, okay, how can I take that and what can I do to kind of bring it? So personalizing it with my own students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then um, and then I thought, do I do a recreation? I thought, okay, you know what? Just start off small. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just need to like I have so many ideas, but starting off really small and just keeping it small, mm -hmm. and then you know having more of the recreation maybe later. Yeah, wow. But I do want to do have maybe have um, maybe having yoga incorporated with the program. So they're kind of relieving some of the math anxiety that some of the students are feel, feeling. Absolutely. Wow, that's brilliant. And uh, people learn better when they're feeling better physically. So, uh, you know, getting them active and then teaching them would be an excellent recipe for success. So, wow, mm -hmm. well done. Yeah. You know? And th that just goes to show how important it is for us to work together and, and to share what we're doing because it can inspire someone um, like yourself. So yes. Good for you. Yes, yeah, so hopefully, you know, it goes underway by next year we'll have something. So we're starting off right now, and hopefully, you know, by October we'll have the program out and going, right? Excellent. And thank you for those slides, like just showing me, okay, I need the timeline, and just, you know, having that structure mm -hmm. yeah. for me to use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you so much. Well, you're very welcome, and my email is right there. So if ever you need any other, if you want to bounce ideas off someone or, or whatever, Mm -hmm. um, my role isn't limited to these webinars or my work, whatever. I'm available to anybody who wants any questions or any support or any idea. Um, don't hesitate. That's uh, it's more than just a job. This is uh, this is you know important to me. So. Oh, good. So thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> okay. okay. Bye. Miigwech. Does anybody else have any uh, stories or questions? Okay, well, I, I would love to thank you once again for taking the time to listen to this webinar, and I really hope that you get inspired and, and maybe um, you know, get some of the structure that will help you um, either support somebody in a community-driven project or create your own.